Hi, I'm really glad to be here. Uh, now, I, today, I bring to you uh, an experience that we have uh, as part of the of our CSIRT when we were able to analyze and respond to a cyber attack against a Kubernetes cluster that is not as common besides a lot of misconfigurations that are always present uh, in most uh, cloud native implementations, especially in those that are part of small and medium business because time to market is like the main thing to do. And with that, it's like they forget or they don't implement a lot of security measures that are we're going to be here um, and for you to understand how an attacker can uh, move laterally and how to, they can get access to this kind of infrastructure and how are we able to detect those and analyze the information that we can have from a cloud provider. Uh, first of all, I'm Santiago, I'm from Argentina. Uh, I'm really glad and honored to be here, especially because uh, it's a place that has been here longer than I am. I have born in 1992, so it's like really, really honor for me. Um, and we're going to start with some technical concepts. What is Kubernetes? Kubernetes is a tool, it's a bleeding edge technology that is widely being applied in cloud-based environments. Uh, and it's used to easily run code uh, in distributed environments. So with Kubernetes, you can run code in a containerized form, like a Docker image, and being able to maintain the state of what you are running. For example, if you want to have a web service with a backend and a database, you can say, I need the web service to be at 80% of resources, and not more, and if the Kubernetes cluster understand that for some reason your resources are, going, are being like drained, it will add a code, we would add pods or, 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 or running containers to that environment to handle that demand. Uh, it also has the capability to work with the cloud provider like AWS or GCP or Azure to increase the amount of servers supplying your, uh, your infrastructure to handle that demand also. So if for some reason you have three servers or 100 and you need 200, it will automatically scale that infrastructure to meet those requirements. It, it means that it has a lot of power because the users are the service accounts that are being used within the Kubernetes cluster need to interact not only with the code base, but also with the cloud provider. And they normally do it using different types of credentials. In AWS, you use users or roles. The issue with users, besides they are easily deployed, is that they require you to hard code access keys and secret access keys in the servers. So we are continually reviewing infrastructure and we always see this type of configuration when you can uh, get from a server a file with the hard-coded credentials. And as we were, as I was saying, that those credentials has the power to work and to interact with the, your cloud infrastructure. So that's really, really dangerous. Um, and among, besides the servers, the Kubernetes cluster interacts with other kinds of service within the cloud provider. One example of this is the ECR registry. ECR is a, is a, a repository where you can st store your Docker images. So in, in, when you are like applying best practices, you, all the code that you are running should come from inside your infrastructure and not from public repositories. And a lot of companies are implementing this, but not in a really secure way. So if an attacker gets access to your registry, they can, they can infect it with a new image of code that they own and run that image within your Kubernetes cluster without you to notice it. Um, and other services that are supporting Kubernetes from AWS is, are those that are related to logging and monitoring. 
you have AWS CloudTrail, that is a login uh, technology that is used to get all API calls that are executed against AWS and to the Kubernetes cluster. So with that log, you can get information regarding who is pushing images, who is creating users, creating service servers, listing the Kubernetes cluster in your account. All that data, you can get that from, from CloudTrail. Uh, the issue with that is when you enable CloudTrail logs, they take up to 15 minutes to be deployed and, and to, to be shipped to your SIEM or to your, your monitoring solution. So whatever you are seeing in, with, with those logs have like a 15 minutes of delay. And that's like really, really bad. You can query those logs through the event history uh, API that is also part from AWS, and you can get real-time that data from that, but you only will have like a small portions of logs. But if you query that using the AWS CLI, you can get more data than what you can see from the AWS consoles. So these kinds of complexity, uh, it adds complexity to the response, especially if you are like, if you don't, if you haven't implemented the, the, the security detection correctly, because maybe you have security detection rules using the first logs I told you, and you will be detecting everything with 15 minutes of delay, or maybe you are implementing the other way and you are missing events. The other logs that you are, you would have from, from AWS are BPC flow logs that are like the, uh, the network flow from a, from, a, from a VLAN inside AWS, and those have five, five minutes of delay. So it's important for us to, to take that in, in notice. AWS also offers us another tool that is called Garduti, that is a threat detection tool. Uh, what this, this does is to correlate data from your VPC flow logs, that, that are your network logs, from your API logs from CloudTrail, from DNS, and it has a lot of, of threat intelligence and BIP that you can use to get alerts from what's going on inside your cluster. So it can create alerts based on misbehaviors within your AWS tenant and within your Kubernetes cluster. It's not perfect, but it's better than nothing. And most of the time when we face a client that is a, it, it, it's, has a cloud environment and haven't been working with security a lot, it's really easy for us to implement this and start getting notifications on, on what's going on. Okay, what happened? Uh, I'm going to show you a quick demo regarding the, the initial access. This is how a, the attacker was able to, to retrieve the credentials from the server. So, yeah, it's, it's okay. So here, the file .aws.credentials is the one that is, uh, is hard-coded in servers and workstations. So if you are analyzing a file, uh, a workstation that is used by a DevOps or a developer that has access to AWS, you should always check for that file because it can, it can uh, it, 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 mean, it means that the developer is using this kind of authentication against the, the AWS tenant. Most of the time, they shouldn't do this in this way, but it's always uh, some kind of authentication of this matter. Then the attacker is getting the caller identity. That is a command that you can use against AWS to get who you are. It's like a who I am but against AWS. As you can see there, the attacker is getting the user Terraform and is interacting with the account, this number account. So with that, the attacker already know that he's using an IAM user that is related with Terraform. Terraform is a, another technology used in cloud environments that is a, it's to create infrastructure as code. So a user that is tied to a Terraform implementation would have a lot of permissions. The, ne the next thing the attacker did was to understand if the user was able to connect to the AWS console. Against AWS, you can connect 
using the, the web console that you can see in your browser, or you can uh, connect, uh, interact like this uh, using the CLI. Most of the attackers try to move quickly to the, to the console because it's easier for them to enumerate the cloud, the cloud environment. As you can see there, with the no such entity error, it says that they have not access to the AWS console. And then he's creating the user, it's creating a login profile. So the attacker was, with that creation, the attacker was able to log in to the console using their, their credentials that he has already um, created. We were able to detect this attacker because we saw that API call when the, he was creating the login profile for a user that should be a programmatic user. Um, so that was the misbehavior that alerted us and started the, the response. This is how the AWS console looks. So as you can see there, you need the account ID that we get from the get caller identity the username and password, and with that you can log into the web console. Then the attacker continue with some enumeration. Uh, the, well, among the things that they enumerated, they get the S3 buckets in the account. The S3 buckets are file storage services where a lot of data can be stored, like passwords or, 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 or access keys, or maybe confidential data. It's, it's, it's used like a OneDrive, but in AWS. Then he lists all the AWS clusters. It was really, when we see enumerations in AWS, we, we are used to see a lot of events. It's like a, 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 a spread of, of, of a lot of events that don't, ma don't make sense with the normal behavior of, of, of an account. In this case, the attacker was going directly to the, to the AKS cluster, what, what was really misleading for us because it was like they already knew that they were going to target in this path. Um, and then they enumerated the ECR registry what I was telling you and how, and how, to, how to run an, a Docker image in, in Kubernetes. So with this information, the attacker was able to implant a Docker image in the ECR registry using the, this command. The, implant, the implantation is used for them to disguise their, their malware inside their AWS infrastructure. So whenever they are running the, the code in the EKS cluster, the origin of those API calls are going to come from inside the AWS. So if somebody gets to implant their, 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 Docker, their compromised Docker image in the ERCR cluster, they will, they will be able to, to run that code and the origin would be like internal, or more de most detection tools would not detect that. Here is another demo on how the attacker got access to the cluster using the, ter the, the Terraform user. So it lists the EKS cluster and get the data that we were saying before, especially the, the, the cluster name. I'm going to fast forward this a little bit. And then it used this command that is update kubeconfig. What it will do is would retrieve from AWS another configuration file that are the credentials that are used for the attacker to log in to the Kubernetes cluster. You can see there that the, the, the file was created in this in this path. So again, if you are analyzing our station that is tied to a DevOps, try to find this cube config because if those are leaked, the attacker is able to interact with the cluster uh, in an easy way. And then what they are going to do is to apply a Docker image. This is a test Docker image, but this is going to run uh, this Docker image inside the Kubernetes cluster. 
As you can see, the, the implementation is really easy if you, do, if you haven't hardened the cluster and the, and the EKS instance properly. Most of the companies, uh, ex when they are fixing misconfigurations, handle all the perimetral, perimetral uh, security and don't uh, focus on what's going on within their, their software, the software development lifecycle. So the clusters are really easy to interact once you get access to, the, to these kind of users. Um, if, you analyze, if we analyze the, the Docker image, this is a test, but what I wanted to show you, this is what we found. We found a string like this in the, in the, in the manifest of the image that, were, that, that, that was being run. Uh, that means that the image was pulled from the ECR registry and thus it was pulled from inside your AWS cluster. So what did we do? First of all, we, we were able to detect the alert, as I told you, be, be, because of that console login. Garduti alert us about an anomalous behavior based on, on, on that Terraform user. From the Garduti alert, you can get a lot of information. It's really interesting because you can get source IP address, you can get access keys, you can get the, the IAM user that is compromised. So it's a really good point for you to start that, uh, that, analyze, that analysis. So it's based on the, the credential that uh, Carduti was letting us know that was compromised, the first thing we looked was the event history logs, those I told you that are the, the, the API logs that you can find in, in AWS and they are always on. As you can see there, we have list clusters. We were able to see the, the get color identity. Um, this is uh, really important because we, when you start to see these kind of events, you are you 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 can know that you are going you are being enumerated. I, this is another demo on how to retrieve these logs if you don't. If, if you haven't implemented them, or if you, if you need to interact with an AWS cluster that you don't own, especially if you are a consultant, you can get those logs in a way, uh, besides they are not enabled because uh, the API is enabled by, by default in all AWS accounts, besides the client has implemented that or not. So we are setting up a date and we are going to retrieve those logs um, and only get those that are part of uh, are are being uh, executed from the Terraform. Um, you are going to get a lot of JSON events um, that are have a lot of information, but are really difficult to analyze. But again, the information is there, and that's the important thing. Uh, we can parse that to, in a CCV format for for us to do some analysis. Uh, this is an example of a cloud tree log. Here you can see, for example, the, the account ID. You can see the, it's interacting with the ECR, the Terraform user, the API. You can get, get the, source, the, the user agent. You can get the source IP. It's a lot of information that's really useful, and it's nice to, be, to know that we have it. The other log that I was referring to you is the VPC flow log that you can also get it from an, from an S3 bucket. They are always deployed in an S3 bucket or in a CloudWatch uh, log group, but it's more common to see those in an S3 bucket. And this is how you can get them. Um, you are going to get, download those objects from the bucket, and we are going to do some, some quick analysis for you to see how an VPC flow logs uh, looks like. So it's going to start dumping the, the objects. And after that, you get the log.chase it, and you can easily get that data. So you here have your, your source IP, your destination IP, 
if the connection was accepted or of, of what of was rejected. So again, a lot of information for us to analyze. Uh, we also developed this small tool to filter, to get quick data from, from these logs because uh, when you are handling a lot of accounts or, or in, a, in, in a distributed environment, you get a lot of data to analyze. So with this, you, we were able to we are able to get the source IPs or the IPs that are interacting with the, our, our AWS tenant, and we can filter those using virus total to, to get something like this that allows us to understand which uh, actions are being executed from inside our AWS cluster, that, like these that are from, from Amazon and those that are coming from another, from, from another parts of the world, and also if they have hits in, in, in virus total. So th this allows us to, to, to triage faster um, logs and whatever is going on within, within the, the incident. And later, the, and lastly, the, the response, when we, we were able to analyze everything. We understood that the Terraform user was compromised. We got that within the cloud trail logs, the attacker was able to do that pull, that pull to, the, to the Docker image and to insert that code in the cluster. The, we, what we needed to do was to remove the IAM user um, so for, to, to, to stop the attacker and to make them not having access to the to the to the to our AWS tenant, uh, deleting a user in AWS is not trivial because you need to remove a lot of things before actually deleting the user. So you need to delete the login profile. You need to disable access keys, and most of the time, if you don't do that, they can still have persistence in the in the tenant. So we are using this tool to to do all that stuff consistently. So here you're going to see that the, we are going to delete access keys. In this example, for example, the, 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 the user was uh, executing actions or was able to execute actions from different access keys and secret access keys. So that leads us to another uh, investigation branch because now we need to understand if the other access keys were being executed or were, were being, were, uh, they, they did anything with, with the other access keys. They also deleted the, 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 the policy. So this user had an, an administrator policy. And lastly, they, the, the tool deletes the user. Um, and lastly, what I wanted to show you is this is an example of the CSV that we can retrieve from the cloud trail logs. Um, here, for example, we have a pivot table with the Terraform user, and we have the API calls that were being executed from that user. And we can see from where those, those API calls were executed. As you can see, we have some AWS internal stuff. This is how you should be uh, a, a, an, an image being executed from inside the Kubernetes cluster. Um, again, there is a lot of information in the, in the AWS cluster that is enabled by default. And when you are facing against an AWS-based or a Kubernetes-based incident, it's important for us to know that it's already there. Um, and also knowing that a lot of configuration besides cloud is known as secure by default in some way, it's not. And most of the configurations to interact with the cloud, especially with credentials and users, um, are based on files that are easily readable with, for whoever gets access to the workstation. So it's important for us first to stop that in a hardening the, the cloud properly and also in an incident to start retrieving that to understand if the, if, which is the impact of the, of the compromise. So that should be it. So. 
Thank you.